Okay, thanks for your patience with us this morning. I wanted to welcome you all to the Orange Public Library. If you get a chance later to check it out, it's a beautiful building. So I'm Jackie Tran, and I'm with the Orange County Alliance for Community Health Research, which is OCACHR. And I'm happy to welcome you here this morning to the first um, in our series of workshop trainings for community research. Um, so welcome. The Community Health Workshop Series is a series of five workshops um, that are intended to increase opportunities for community and academics to partner in research, especially regarding health issues here in Orange County. And the key piece of this is really engaging all of you and faculty as well to engage in community-based participatory research, which is CBPR or CBPAR, Community-Based Participatory Action Research. And this is being brought to all of you again from the Orange County Alliance for Community Health Research, which is a new partnership that was established here in 2011 with funding from the federal government through the National Institutes of Health, and these are all of the partners. You have um, our lead agency, which is the University of California, Irvine, the ICTS, which is the Institute for Clinical and Translational Sciences, Cal State Fullerton, the Children and Families Commission of Orange County, the Orange County Healthcare Agency, Orange County Asian Pacific Islander Community Alliance, or CAPICA, which I'm also uh, a staff member, and the Public Health Foundation Enterprises. And really the reason that this is so important to Orange County, the focus of this grant is really to look at translational science. And these are a lot of really big words which are all going to get demystified today. And the idea really is bringing research from the bench, the clinical research, to, our to the bedside and then out to our communities. And I don't know if you all know, but right now the average time it takes for the discovery of a brand new drug to reach our communities is about 13 years. Maybe in, in some, some health issues, 13 years isn't a very long time. For some health issues, that's a very, very long time, and too long to wait for a treatment that will be effective and possibly you know, uh, provide good quality of life. So what these uh, CTSAs, or ICTSs, are meant to do is to help really make that happen a little bit faster, a little more effective, and more appropriately when it reaches out to communities. Right? So we don't just want to get it out faster, but be all wrong. We want to do it right. And a big piece of doing it right is really engaging community, whether that's asking questions in focus groups or encouraging recruitment in clinical trials so that we know what will happen if it gets to the community sooner and faster. And we are one of 60 CTSAs in the country. There are about six in California alone, which makes us a really rich state in terms of resources. But it's also about getting all that information out to all of you who are working and engaging community and letting folks know what resources are available. It's kind of like knowing there's a sale, but nobody knows about it, so no one benefits from it, right? So that's why you're here today, and it's very important. This is a real technical slide, but really what it's saying is how do we get the information and discoveries out into our communities sooner and more effectively? So this, the project itself has three major aims, and one of the major aims is the workshop series, which you're a part of today. And this is going to be the first of a set of series. There will be other trainings in the future. For this. So for those of you who have colleagues who might be interested or those who've registered in our waitlist, there will be future opportunities. But this is the first series with the full five workshops that we'll be engaging in. The second aim is to gather community leaders and community members with faculty researchers to talk about pressing issues in Orange County. So the first group that actually has gathered has discussed low birth weight issues in Orange County. And some of the opportunities we're hoping to build on is to engage in proposals to address the gaps in data that we have here in Orange County. And Shannon Pizzola, who's in the back, is my colleague, and we're community research advocates, they call us CRAs. And our job is really to reach out to and engage folks. And she, as well as another colleague of mine, uh, Lamore, are the folks that are facilitating these work groups. The other exciting thing that we're hoping to bring to all of you here in Orange County is the web portal. This is going to be the website link, and it's going to be information specific to Orange County in regards to health issues, as well as population-based data. And so it is under construction right now, but Shannon is actually working as we speak to get it up and running and to have resources for all of you about the things that are going on here in Orange County. And the truth is, there's going to be gaps. Not everything you click on is going to have pages and pages of data. Some things you click on are going to have pages and pages of data, but the idea of facilitating these workshops is also then to address where there are places where we can work together to do research, to get information, and to put information about our communities and the needs 
onto the map, which would be the website. So that is going to be a living, breathing tool that's going to evolve and grow through the years. And we hope that shortly you'll find that there are some great resources you may not know about that are secrets here in Orange County about the work that you're doing here in Orange County. Okay. So we're a big group, and we didn't get all name tags, although there are little name tents on your desk. They're a little bit small, so if you're interested in putting your name out there, that would be great. And I'm going to ask you to start by getting up out of your seats and using your human bingo cards to make some new friends. Okay? It, one of the key things that we want you to get out of coming to these meetings isn't just to sit and take notes all day, but to network and meet people you haven't worked with before, engage with agencies that could leverage the work of your own agency, and to make new friends. Okay? So we're going to get up and get out of our seats. We're going to learn about others in the room and meet new people. And we're going to see what kind of folks you can find in the room, because this is also about how do we partner and create other relationships for the programs that we represent, right? And so, don't, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. The idea is just to get up out of your seats, maybe turn to your right, turn to your left, turn to the person behind you, introduce yourself, tell them who, who you are, what communities you may represent or work with, the agencies that you come from. And as you find, if there's somebody that fits a box, write their contact name down so you know how to get a hold of them later. Okay? So we'll do that for about 10 minutes. We be respectful, listen to others, but also really hear others, right? Ask questions. There are no silly questions. This is a space to engage and ask questions of each other and of our great speaker today. <laughs> to check out assumptions. So we all know a lot of great things, but there's also a lot of awesome things we don't know. So think about that. To respect different opinions, perspectives, and experiences. They're all valid. To seek clarity and clarify, right? Don't make assumptions. We may sometimes use the same words, but could be completely talking about different things, and that's in English, right? So let's seek clarity. And then to turn off our technology, okay? So if we can agree to that, is there anything else folks think we might need to add for our group expectations today? Awesome, okay. So again, we're here today for the Research in the Community Workshop. And really the goal of this is to build academic and community research partnerships to address the health issues that are going on here. And health is a really big word. We're not just talking about clinical health, we're talking about mental health, right? We're really talking about well-being, and a lot of things can fit under that. And we're not specifically talking about any health issue today, but looking at ways that we can use tools that can help our communities better reach health in this, in this county, right? And really, as we talked about earlier, we're looking at transdisciplinary, translational science, right? Taking bench to bedside to community, and really ensuring that the discoveries that are made in the labs are actually having an effect and benefit in our community. Our key training objectives are here. You can read that, and they're all in your slides, so I don't think um, I need to read them for you. And then our overall goal for today, this is our outline, and so we're going to get busy real quick in the next couple of hours, is to really talk about research, different methods and designs, as well as CBPR, and how that actually is a tool that might be effective for all of our communities. And then we're also going to dialogue about health issues and health topics that are important to us in ways that we can possibly use the research designs, methods, and tools that could help our communities. And then at the end of the session, we're going to talk a little bit about the ethics of conducting research. So everybody thinks research is so awesome and great, but there are also a lot of concerns and things that we should consider. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. So today, I am really pleased to have Dr. Sora Park Tangis here here. You really in for a treat. She is a professor in the Department of Health Science and the director of the Health Promotion Research Institute at Cal State Fullerton. Her teaching and research focuses on community health promotion amongst diverse populations, particularly Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Her scholarship applies community-based participatory research principles to understanding and addressing cancer health disparities, including tobacco prevention, cancer early detection, and survivorship. She has served as the principal investigator or co-principal investigator of over a dozen, two dozen, sorry, extramurally funded cancer-related studies, including the co-principal investigator of the National Cancer Institute-funded Community Network Program Center, WINCAR, leading the Avenue Network for Cancer Disabilities, for uh, Network for Cancer Awareness Research and Training, and the R01 Support Our Women study to promote PAP testing among specific Islander women. 
Her research has been published in peer-reviewed journals such as the American Journal of Public Health, the Journal of the American Medical Association, Health Education and Behavior, and Health Promotion Practice. Dr. Tangisiri received her bachelor's degree in biochemistry from UC Berkeley and her master's degree and doctorate in community health from the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Tangisiri. Second, um, there's a huge tall order, and I don't know what you guys, if you know what you got yourselves into, but normally, when, um, whenever I've taught things like research design, um, community-based participatory research, um, multicultural issues, ethics, etc., that's about three different classes. So we're going to cover in three hours what I think I usually cover in about uh, a year and a half in our master's <laughs> program. <laughs> So one, after this, I have a feeling we're all going to feel very tired. And two, you should all get a degree. <laughs> um, so first of all, can you hear me? Okay? Okay, great. So I would like to start off. Normally, I really want to get to know the folks who are going to be spending three intimate hours together with me. But I realized if I did introductions the way I would want to do it, we'd kill about an hour and a half. So rather than do it, I'm going to do a shortcut and try and get to know each one of you as we go along. I've been jotting names. If you've got a little, those little tiny, I've got my glasses, little tiny um, name tags in front of you. Um, but I do want to get an idea of why are you here? What are you hoping to get out of this? Because um, I want to make sure I try and meet your needs and hopefully, I don't know, Check my assumptions about <laughs> what we do or do not know. So can someone give that? Yeah, why are you here? I wanted to participate because normally mental health is the last uh, person on the totem pole, mm -hmm. and it has, a, and even though it is the last um, uh, field, health field that's mentioned, it usually is the root of most of the health problems that are out in the community, if not many of the problems that are out in the community. Okay, so um, mental health specific, but certainly for all other for issues as well, right? Trying right. to address needs that are um, invisible or not getting attention. Correct. Good. Okay. What else? And I'm scribbling, and you'll now see why students complain because you can't read my writing. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I, I believe that the research in general in public health is not as um, as common, and uh, especially when it comes to community research, mm -hmm. and uh, we need uh, more <coughs> funding goes to other other areas where the research can give a broader spectrum as well as the gaps can be you know really identified, so the funding can be uh, can be more uh, resourceful. Good. Okay.
so the opposite is kind of what the research perspective was, right? <laughs> How do we engage each other? And I just like, did all that. Ditto, okay, ditto that, ditto that. Like it. Anything else? Yeah. Um, in addition to many of those, I wanted to also meet others that are working in the community in different disciplines. Excellent. Do you think we covered it? Who else? Yes. And I'm curious, just as a community volunteer, I want to make sure that I know where to go and how can I help so you guys can reach the community. Okay, interesting. Anything else? Yes. Um, um, one other thing that I want to get out of this workshop is to increase my understanding how to better access to hard to reach populations, um, especially at this moment we have, um, one, my agency is serving uh, immigrant refugees population, and then they have sometimes the issues of how to reach them um, in the area that it's so hard to go, and also um, try to get involved those people in the research process mm -hmm. is also an issue. Um, that we have been facing. Mm -hmm. You said you're from a community organization? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. I know you're running out of space there, but... Um, I can squeeze it. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the reasons why I'm here is, uh, you know, we really want to see um, how we can more effectively impact the community, um, but most uh, importantly, it's really assessed programs and services that we're providing um, are able to create that impact and if we do need to make any adjustments or changes that we can do so quickly and uh, you know most effectively with the resources that we have been allocated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Evaluation. Classic lot of evaluation. Did I see one other? Maybe? I have my hand up, but you don't have no more space. So. I've it's got space, space. look! It's actually the same as so close to where we are. Um, community organization that started the innovation projects and it's being monitored by an outside agency, actually UCLA and, mm -hmm. and, and Martin together. And the way they're going at it and setting up this research design to monitor this project for the next few years is so involved and so intricate. And I'm getting my doctoral dissertation right now and I have my project, but it's nothing like what they're doing. And so I'm trying to understand from a different standpoint in public health, particularly or public mental health, Exactly why they're going through these these degrees of um, checks and kind of balances. I know it will be a research study that will be published, so that's part of it. But the mm -hmm. second part of it is that sometimes I find that, that well, I'm just trying to find out where the internal contents are. I'm trying to get the word of the are we now getting inclusiveness and things like that. Mm -hmm. This is such an unambitious group. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? We just want to save the world. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am with Oral Health, and like she mentioned, the better, like mental health is not something that's addressed, and so is Oral Health. And uh, I work with an organization <coughs> that uh, we do a lot of school programs, and I'm here to learn how to network and... Uh, how to what? Work? How to network and... Network. Okay. Yes. Okay. And uh, okay. improve my ability to, to do research. Uh, meet other working, right? Mm -hmm. Networking. Okay, I'm going to stop.
stop this group. Otherwise, there's no way I would be able to do these things. <laughs> okay, let me um, make sure that I put these up so I can keep a track and see what we're knocking out as we do this.
CDPR, the idea of report back to communities are important, not just waiting for the end. We're kind of trying to do that in the middle. Good. Anything else come up? Funding. Funding, yes. How are we supposed to actually get ourselves, you know, to some, in our community, some support to do the kind of work that needs to happen? Yes. Using the evidence for the good of Great. So what I'm hearing is not only do you collect, you, you pose the questions, you collect the information, you do it in some kind of way to show impacts you want to produce, reports, or et cetera, but you actually then want to go and have it inform policy, I mean, inform programs. And might I say policy, right? That there are actually ways that we would, we would want people who aren't necessarily directly in the research to be looking at what work, or lo and looking at what the needs are, and supporting that, right, with greater funding, or with, right, changes in laws, or with enforcement of the healthy um, community health uh, policies we have currently have. So ideally, um, although this is going to be kind of a whirlwind on CBPR, what we would love to have in this room, and we do have a fairly good uh, diversity of are different kinds of people. This is not a presentation just for students, who are the people who I usually talk with. Right? This is not a presentation just for university folks, or not just a geared towards just community folks. Right? We need to be all involved in order to make the kind of impact that we talked about wanting to get. Okay, so let's get through the boring stuff, right? Um, okay, so this is just my point about research, action, investigation, questions, practice, reflection, evidence. What did you say? Changing the world. Changing the world, right? I think we heard all of those things in the, in, um, the things that people raised. Okay, so let's just talk very um, generally about what the, the general steps are. I will apologize a huge mea culpa. This really is not going to be the time where we can go into some of the level of detail some of you might want in order to figure out how do you do some of these steps, you know, in what kind of context, for what kind of questions. We're going to kind of take a broad brushstroke of the, the general phases of research, and then we will continue to revisit this as we um, elevate some issues that come up particular issues in collaborative research. So the first one is identify and define your research topic. Right? In fact, I heard some of you say that you kind of want to get to know what about communities, right? And what are the needs? Some of you have an idea of the needs and you want to connect up with researchers. That's all about trying to identify what is the topic area you want to work in. Oopsie. <coughs> oh, I have my app arrows. They just didn't show up. Bad me. Okay, so number one, identify and define a research topic. Number two is about setting the research question. Everything derives from having um, an appropriate, applicable research question. And I, um, for those of you in the room who have actually been in some of my classes, you know, I always go back to what is it that you're trying to investigate? Right? I see Becky. Rolling your eyes. <laughs> it's not like it was thinking on you. Um, we'll talk maybe this much about that today, but at least knowing, right, how, about how it, that process is supposed to unfold. <coughs> Definitely number three is determining how to conduct the research. Right? And who should be determining that? And what kind of conversations should we be having together to figure out what the most appropriate ways are to um, conduct that research? Once the research, what we call the design and methods, are set, which is all about the content, then we go out and we actually collect them. And I heard several people already say about how difficult that is in communities and certain populations, right? Either because they don't know about being part of research, right, and we want to try and get them more involved, or there's so much research going on that there's what we call respondent fatigue. Right? There's just so much going on and we don't know how to keep people engaged. But anyway, all, all, um, res all research is about collecting some kind of information. 
Only some of that information would be what we think about as surveys, right, or measurements on people. There are a whole other um, ways of collecting information that could be a lot less participant and human, what we call human subject intensive, right, observations, document review, right. Some of the things I will show you a little bit of um, examples today. Okay, so what do we do after we collect the information? We definitely want to analyze and interpret it, right? And although this seems like something that, oh, that's just about knowing some statistics or right, getting some people on board to, to help you figure out what you've got. This is also about trying to figure out, I think what we said, the, the validity of the results, right? So you got some results somehow. Is it really true? Is it really what the answer to that your research question is? Or did we miss something? And yes, I always say to my students that you can have the best laid plans, and then you do it, and then you only afterwards go like, oh, I forgot. We should have asked a different question. We should have figured out a slightly different information, right? So the whole process of research is to find out what you know, and of course, what you missed. Which never, never actually happens to me. Um, <laughs> Certainly, we have a responsibility after we analyze the information, right, to disseminate it. I heard some of the examples of dissemination, specifically reports, um, publications. Um, I would say that, you know, there are a lot of other ways to do dissemination, and we're going to talk a lot about what communities need. In order to keep engaged in research, right, we need to engage them in what the findings are, what the benefits, and how that could be used, including how to incorporate them into programs, right? And then, like I implied, since we never do a 100% job, or if we do a fabulous job, it always opens the next door to say, like, wait a minute, now I want to know, right? I, I, had, I figured out the needs, we've got some idea of programs, now I want to know can we develop an evaluated program? And yes, start it all over again. So this is my, my spinning around life cycle in a nutshell. If you're wondering what I do for my living, I'm just spinning around in this circle for the rest of my life. Eventually, hopefully, I'll get off this, this rat race and actually um, figure out some other things in my life. Uh, does that seem to admit, need what other people have as their general assumptions about what goes in here? then great, I'm going to now confuse it. Confuse the heck out of it by saying that really any way you look at research, you can break it down into these steps. So one thing that you have in your binders is a little bit more um, extensive way of breaking these steps down. So you could ask yourself, right, at the different stages, identifying your research topics, setting questions, determining and collecting information, and um, just, uh, analyzing and reporting, right? Breaking it down to some more general questions. So for instance, what interests you? Right? What do you want to find out about? And I am um, a researcher, but my area is in behavioral science. So it's kind of like when you have a hammer and everything looks like a nail. <laughs> I see everything from the lens of, how can we get behavior to change? Or why are people doing that behavior? How can we add to that behavior? Or how can we have that person support someone else's behavior change? And I look at things like smoking, um, physical activity, nutrition, right? Um, cancer screening, uh, cancer support groups, and how people get people to increase their quality of life. Um, so the, the things that interest me are in that realm. Right? Now I'm guessing for some of you who said you're into oral health, <coughs> the things that interest you are questions that deal with either oral health or the things that are associated, mm -hmm. right? About what goes on in families around oral health, what goes on eating with oral health, right? Um, accessing providers, oral health. For those of you who said mental health, similarly, right? I mean, we have our own interests. This is not about giving those interests up. Right? Because someone else says, no, you should be sort of researching something else, right? But it's trying to figure out how to be involved in research processes that reflect your interests. Um, I, once you 
figure out, yes, I want to know something around uh, mental health needs among, uh, I don't know, caregivers of, oh, see, this is my problem. In classes, I kind of start spinning out of control and get so excited about itchy areas. I should just ask you, what is your, is there an example, um, a mental health example or any kind of example we could use? Otherwise, I'm going to start creating my own examples. ADD. ADD. Are you saying that I am? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, attention deficit disorder? Okay, that's what interests you? Yeah. Okay. It could be. It could be. Yeah. Great. Uh, among a particular population? Children. Children and ADD. Okay. So, love it. And I love how you could just say it instantly. That's what it is, right? Um, what is already known about the topic, right? So this isn't about going out and trying to, for yourself or for this area or for your community, trying to start all from scratch. What we want to do is build on past research, right? Oh, so much easier, much less exhausting. So it also involves trying to get to know, right, what else has been done out there. Um, and then trying to figure out what those gaps are. Once that is, happens, what is the one question that emerges? And yes, research is all about starting big, right? Needs of a community, going um, smaller. Let's look at ADD among children. Now let's go smaller. What are those needs and gaps? Maybe we already know. I'm going to start making stuff up because this is my area. But maybe we already know um, that there is certain... Uh, level of ADD in a population, but it's about how to better um, screen and detect it early. No? Am I making this up completely? It can be. It can be. Parents to know. Okay, so maybe it's about trying to figure out what parents know so they can recognize it, get assistance and support. Okay, so now among parents, it's trying to figure out what's the one question we want to answer. Right? So you'll often see in, in research an inverted triangle. We want to start with the big ideas and distill them to the one question. Or the maybe two questions you want to ask, address. So maybe the question is, what do parents know about detecting or um, understanding, identifying ADD, um, early signs of ADD in their children? Maybe we already know that, though. And the question then becomes, um, what do uh, parents know about services out in the community, right? Or maybe we already know that and we want to know, well, how well are the services being used? And how can we make them better? See, as a researcher, I can come up with lots of questions. And now you're going to tell me, Sora, pick one. <laughs> right? So that's the whole um, uh, challenge for all of us, right? Taking our big ideas and trying to get it down and just sell it down. Once we figure that out, we're going to talk a little bit about how we'll collect that information so the researcher, so after the researcher's beliefs and their practical experience, all of you, um, I am now going to now call for the rest of this time all of you researchers, right? Because you really are. Number one, because you obviously felt selected to be here, so you're interested in it. And number two, you've all got beliefs about what the needs are, right, from what you see. You've got all, all have practical experiences. I'm sure, pretty sure, you're all keeping up with the topic, right? By reading reports, by going to websites, by following the news. You're all researchers. So it's about figuring out what the best approach to take as researchers, and then obviously figuring out the methods, tools, techniques, and then figuring out what it is, how we're going to do something. Okay. Um, so let's figure out first, since I just said all of you are researchers today. At the beginning, two slides ago, I asked you how many of you are researchers, and I saw four hands. So why didn't the rest of you raise your hands? Okay, so Vita says that's not what she does at work. So when you go to work, those of you, I think the majority of you said that you're from community-based organizations, and about half of you consider yourself service providers. So when you applied for that job, when you got your job description, and now you're going in, right, you're hired, and you're doing your work, you go in and you see clients, right? Or 
you develop materials. Right? Or you go to a lot of meetings <laughs> to meet up with other service providers to figure out how to connect better. Or you're developing new programs and trying to find funding. Okay. None of these things involve research, right? <laughs> <laughs> Does it involve your own beliefs and experiences? Yes. Does it involve trying to figure out what more needs to be done? Yes. Okay. So I do understand that for most of us, though, we don't have the luxury, like me, actually. I mean, I do get paid to be a researcher, and I am the luckiest person for being able to do that. Most of us don't get right, that kind of, necessarily, time, physical time, mental time, etc., to do this. But, so who, do, who usually does research? Who's usually classically considered the researcher? People at universities. People at universities. <laughs> and why? Because they have PhDs. Because they have PhDs! <laughs> oh, I like this group. Can we just get right down to it? This is not wasting time. How many people agree with that? Most researchers, people who you think have a researcher on their card, are because they're at universities and usually with PhDs. Yeah. I'd say a minority. So who else would you classically consider researchers? If they're not the PhDs from Cal State Fullerton or UC or whatever. Well, who else? Grad students. Grad students. <laughs> and the students of the PhDs. <laughs> okay, now you're getting technical. <laughs> okay. They're still at universities. They still have some sort of higher degree or higher degree aim. So we're not necessarily talking PhDs, right? People can have all sorts of different kinds of degrees that give them the coursework to conduct research. OK, so if I threw in masters, PhDs, at universities, students and research and faculty who, uh, does, that, does that usually what people think are classically researchers? How many people say yes? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is anyone saying no? Is there, am I missing anyone? Who else? Heads of programs. Heads of programs. Good. Why? It's not because they have to track what they have. They have to actually find funding for these programs and they have to actually develop them for the future. Okay. So at some point, there's got to be a timeline there about what you're doing. Good. So heads of programs have the responsibility for developing new efforts. And that often takes the kinds of things we already talked about, right? Right? A lot of experience out in the field, understanding of what the gaps are, looking at the literature, looking at what else has been done, writing the grant proposals, getting the money to actually do it. There are a lot of research skills in there. Good, I love it. And I saw one other hand. Anyone else? I think yes. I could be wrong. I would say undergrads. Like okay. There's a lot of undergrads that actually do research at um, Cal State or UCF. Absolutely. I'm so glad you said that. So it's not necessarily someone with a a uh, master's or PhD, but someone who's going for their mm -hmm. BA, bachelor's degree, because they've been taking some coursework, mm -hmm. because they have some capstone um, projects they need to do. Mm -hmm. Good. So I'm still hearing universities or select few at, can you, at, um, at services mm -hmm. providers. Yes? Research institutions and government agencies. Okay, good. So, and why? Why are they generally researchers? Because they're, well, a government agency is depending on the specific agency they're looking for more information in a specific field, if it's children, if it's health, if it's politics, if, so different specific areas. And is it all government um, uh, officials and public officials? Certain kinds, right, are involved yeah. in research. They usually have higher degrees, right? Yes. Generally, I'm from, right? Okay. <laughs> so we're starting to see some overlap. Maybe one other. Who else? Yes. Yeah. Well, profits. They all have their research and design department so that they can improve their products and make more money. Absolutely. Did everyone hear that? So for profits because they often ha times have a research and development, right, um, section because they're trying to develop, innovate, develop new things. Um, so I would, again, like to assert that for the time we are all in this room researchers. But that's not the normal job we usually play, right? For most of us. I'd like to take a few minutes and actually take us through an exercise. You guys willing to get up and do a little walking around? OK. First, I need four, um, four uh, volunteers, people who would volunteer to be consultants. And I'm actually looking at the back of the room for people who actually raised their hands initially and said that they were researchers. 
Can I pick on you? Yes? Three ladies. Can I have four of you stand up? All four of um, I have, are there four of you? Three of you? Yes, and you? Okay, so one, two, three. And who's the fourth? Do I have anyone else? Should I pick on Rupert, who I also saw as a researcher? Okay, oh, four. Arda, okay, great. So, um, ladies, so that we um, know um, how to call you when we're talking about you after you leave the room. Um, what are your names? Ar I know Arda. I'm Arda. I'm Mo from UCI. Mo. Heather? Lisa from UCL. Lisa. Fabulous. Now we're going to ask you to leave your room. <laughs> Give us just for a few minutes to organize the rest of us and we'll ask you to come back. Okay, I'm going to take this off right now. Well, actually, no, I'll do one quick thing. Um, we're going to actually now break it into groups and I'd like to be able to mix it up a little bit. So I'm going to go around the room and just count off one or two. Okay? So can I ask Laura to start? You're number one. One. Two. One. Two. One. Two. Oh, remember your number. <laughs> one. Two. One. Two. One. Two. One. Two. One. Two. methodology to collect data. This is not a research, um, research method. What CBPR is, is an orientation to research. It changes the role of who is the researcher and who is the researched. It um, is typically thought of in certain kinds of methods, like qualitative, or where qualitative is more likely to occur. But it can be just as easily done in quantitative and evaluative, et cetera. There are fewer quantitative, fewer surveillance kind of epidemiological studies, although I'll tell you I was just part of a CBPR collaborative that looked at um, looking at cancer, breast cancer, um, higher incidence of breast cancer, and mapping in um, California. So it, it can be done with a group of epidemiologists. Um, and it's an applied method. It's about trying to solve the problems that we see in communities. Right, so this is not, it's, it's less about in the laboratory or in, so certainly I've never collaborated with a biologist. I don't collaborate generally with experimental psychologists that do things in their laboratories under control situations. More with applied kinds of researchers. And the goal is to influence change in communities, um, in systems, programs, and policies, the kinds of stakeholders that we've already talked about. Okay, so there are many definitions of CBPR, um, and the Kellogg Foundation has kind of summarized it this way. CBPR is a collaborative approach to research that equitably involves all partners in the research process. That means all of you in the room. And recognizes the unique strengths that each partner brings. CBPR begins with a research topic of importance to the community with the aim of combining knowledge and action for social change to improve community health and eliminate health disparities. And I'm a health disparities person, so there's a, there's a twist there. But really, you could do CBPR in all sorts of different kinds, for all sorts of different kinds of issues and problems. I have a question. Yes. Is there something in research, because sometimes we already want some outcome, so our approach is going to be biased to, to lead that outcome. How do we educate ourselves to, to not be biased? Let's talk a little bit about this. Um, if, if you can just hold that question for just a minute. I think that question about bias is wonderful. I want to actually reframe this. This is not about objectivity and subjectivity or, or you know, validity and biased results. This is about actually coming up with research questions and doing research that is more applicable. Sometimes the best questions start because one person sees. I've seen, for example, I've worked with 
um, community-based organizations, where their question, their research question is, uh, you know, does, uh, no, their topic is, I want to show that my program works. Would you say that's a little biased? Kind of, right? From an objective standpoint, right? Except for, isn't that, uh, for many of us, the reason why we're here is when we want to figure out, right? Or not, maybe that doesn't work entirely, but what works? Obviously, we're open to finding out what doesn't work, but we know something works. People keep coming back to us, right? We see people getting better, but we see, right, families improving. We see something. So I would love just to think not necessarily about bias or objectivity, subjectivity, etc., but think more about how to come up with research questions and methods that address real community need. Sometimes it originates from only one person's perspective. The way to do this is very. Um, this is just according to um, um, Meredith Minkler, Barbara Israel, and other CBPR researchers in public health. But let's go through this and just nod your head if you, if you feel like this is something that communities would be interested in. Number one, it recognizes that communities are the important, um, what we call, unit of identity. It's that research needs to happen in communities with real people. Sound good? Builds on strengths and resources within a community. Doesn't only see uh, communities as being tangled up, but sees them as having opportunities to engage, right? To talk, to collaborate in problem solving, to identify those opportunities for dancing instead of <laughs> tangling, etc. Number three, facilitates, the CBPR facilitates collaborative, equitable partnerships in all research phases and involves an empowering and power sharing process that attends to social injustice. That means that if I were to collaborate with Amelia on an ADD right study, although I'm sure I wouldn't because I would be the worst researcher, to, <laughs> university researcher to collaborate with knowing nothing about that topic. But if I did, right, it would mean that we both are in control of this study. We both identify the research question, right? Sometimes Amelia would, would take the lead in identifying who the populations are at risk or what po potential needs we should be addressing. Sometimes a university researcher might take the lead and say, you know, that sounds like we need to have a comparison group. Or, you know, that sounds like we need to have these kind of measures. But it's a conversation that we agree on together. Number four, it promotes co-learning and capacity building through that collaborative process. So if I weren't such a dummy and knew actually something about ADD, then it would be about what more do I need to know about the population and communities right, that my partners work in? And what more would they want to know about research methods, design, data collection that I am, have been trained in? Right? It's about sharing those things with each other. Five, integrates and achieves a balance between research and action for mutual benefits of all partners. So this isn't just about collecting data, right, writing a paper. But CBPR is specifically oriented to making change in communities. So if I just collected information and published an article, would I be following CBPR? If I published the article, but I also went and talked to policymakers, who then implemented a new, let's see, a new funding to provide, to support um, increased screening for ADD and increased services, would that be CPPR? Mm -hmm. Yes. There needs to be something left in the community beyond just the knowledge that was generated and just the, the publications that were done. Number six, emphasizes public health programs of local re relevance and also ecological perspectives that recognize and attend to multiple determinants of health. This is a lot of terminology. First, emphasizes local problems. I think we've already talked about that, right? We want to know about what we can do together here. Ecological perspectives. So what's ecology? Environment. Environment, right. So this is not just about looking at individuals, just the, the participants in our research. But we want to make sure that, and this naturally ha happens with CBPR with communities. Communities want to know more than just the 100 people that were part of the study, right? They want to know what the implications are for all their clients. They want to know what the implications are for the development of other programs. People want to know the implications for changing environments and actually creating healthier policies. 
Generally speaking, the more you can take an ecological view, going from the participant, the research participant, but building out, right, and incorporating those perspectives, the more that you're going to see BPI. Um, because of number six, number seven happens. It's a systems development through this process of research, <coughs> where we're going back, we're teaching each other, we're doing the research, we're learning, right? That involves ideally systems. So for example, a lot of research I do relies on community health educators. Turns out that a lot of the organizations I work with have community health educators, right? So this is about giving sustained funding to community health educators. So they can help to not only do services, but evaluate programs. They can learn about data collection. They can learn about writing. And we absolutely do publish together. We can learn together about how to present. And so systems, have systems been supported in that community-based agency? Yes. Hopefully, could that those health educators then go out and train other health educators and new staff? Or train volunteers? That is what they do. And oftentimes, I go with them to help Right? Increase those circles of people who understand and are involved. So that's a systems development. And then finally, disseminates findings to everyone involved, not just the researchers or just the immediate research team. Sorry, I have a quick question. Sure, please. Um, number eight, different findings to all partners. Um, what, how do you find, uh, how you define the partners? Because um, it shouldn't only disseminate findings to the partner, but also back to the community members, report back to them. Because for example, you do a community assessment, you find what the needs in the community are, but so for some reason in that community, there are, uh, those things are not documented officially. So this is the way you inform back, report back, hey, this is your need, that have been documented, and gonna be staying in that community. For example, other counselors come and want to know about that community, they have a proof to show them this is the research that has been done, and, and they want to also inform you the fact that this is the in the community. So mm -hmm. it's not only informed to our partners, but also to the community member itself who mm -hmm. avoid the process. Perfect, bingo. Absolutely. And when, when I talk about partnerships, we're going to talk about different kinds of structures in partnership. Generally speaking, traditional research, the partners are what they call the investigators, right? So I'm the principal investigator of the study, or we are co-principal investigators, the co-investigators together. And so you're right, in classic terms, usually those are the people who will get to know what the results are. They're the ones who are writing the reports, doing the presentations, right? Um, disseminating to our colleagues. But you're absolutely right, in CBPR, it builds on a partnership that's much broader in terms of people who are not usually considered the researchers and the participants, for whom we'll talk towards the end, really that is their data, right? And so it comes into the issue of data ownership, right? And then sharing back and asking permission, right? To continue to um, build off of that, so thank you. Uh, we'll go through at least one <laughs> scenario later on where we'll talk a little bit about um, a, a problem scenario, how would you address that? Okay, so I just want to make sure we understand, I think we do, right, that we're not talking about university research driven anymore, right, where the university researcher selects the topic and the questions. The decisions are made by the university researcher only. And, um, you know, the, I'm, as a university researcher, I'm the only expert in this at the table. And the goal is to generate knowledge and production for its own sake, to publish, etc. But we're really talking about a participatory research paradigm where communities and university researchers together decide. They share power in decision making equally, not necessarily always 50-50. Right? There's sometimes when the community partner will be more informed, and sometimes when the university research will be more informed, but we do everything together. That we are experts in co-learning, and the primary goals are not only improved health, but empowerment and capacity building for all involved. Right, so the left-hand side is what we're aiming towards. Um, I do want to recognize that there's a lot of ways that collaboration happens, not just CBPR. So you could have research that involves community partners in all areas, right, of the research that we talked about today. And this is going to be the examples that I talked about for the rest of today. But I do recognize that there is collaborative research that happens that's not CBPR. It doesn't adhere to all eight of the principles. 
So for example, you could have a community-based program uh, where there's a, a community partner and a research and a university partner. Uh, the community sponsors the research. Um, it's a community sponsor on researcher defined projects. So the researcher, sorry, de defines the project, but involves communities in it to, to different levels, right? Where the res was, was the community at the table from the very beginning? Maybe not. Maybe they were only bought in for like a subcontract to do the participant recruitment, right? And some of those kinds of things. Could be, could be considered, you know, collaboration. Oftentimes, so that kind of work is more considered, you know, that the community organization has a very, very defined job. So where the, it's what we call community place, where the researcher defines everything and then just picks a community to do it in. Oh, I picked your community. Let's collaborate. It. Can you please put together a forum so I can come and speak? Right? Doesn't feel like CBPR, but it is a certain level of, of collaboration all the way down to the real non-collaborative effort. So this would be where, you know, I'm a researcher, I have a question on ADD, I don't even need to go out to communities, I'll just go dig in terms of data that's already been collected and do like secondary data analysis of something that's already out there, the California Health Interview Survey or something like that, right? Or I'm just going to go into my laboratory and just set up a few exper experiments there to figure out the answer to the question, right? So CBPR is not the only way you do collaboration, but I think it's the best. <laughs> yes, Mo. Perhaps you'll address this, um, but it's about the sy systematic power that's embedded in this process. So the goal is always to have this kind of, maybe not 50-50, but this equal relationship. But when it is donor-driven or funded or resource-driven, it's kind of hard to establish this type of partnership Kind of what we saw in the group exercise that you know in one group everyone was looking to the experts to solve the problem. Uh, one person mentioned the concept of incentives. Maybe we'll address this, but I feel like there's some structural power issues that always come in my mind as a as a hopefully a CBPR researcher um, that I never I always get stumped. Like how do I how do I address that? How, what is it that I need to do as a researcher? Let's go to it now. Let's absolutely go to it now. So, CBPR is a great idea. So I, I, pa I fa fast forwarded a few slides. I'll try and revisit something back, but I like that segue. So where does CBPR go wrong? Right? So the problem is, is that we aren't usually engaged in talking about relationships involved in research on an everyday um, conversation. Like, when was the last time you had a conversation at all about research? Right? And sitting at breakfast with someone you know, right? And saying, let's do a research project together. Let's figure out some of those power dynamics. Who would have the decision making? What should each of our roles be? Who would have control over the money? Right? Things like that. So, the last cocktail party you were at, how many of you actually talked about all those things? <laughs> <laughs> now you know what to socialize on. <laughs> so, the problem is that these conversations don't usually happen naturally, right? And so we never get to the part of creating those trusting relationships that can talk about power, right? Before you begin the research process. Usually the time we start making relationships is, oh, I've got a study. Let me find a partner. Don't you trust me? Sure you trust me. I'm trustworthy, right? Let's do it together and let's just see how far we get. Ooh, we disagree. I never want to work with you again. Right? Isn't that the way? So I liken it to this notion of um, stages. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are in a relationship, but do ever go into a relationship and say, I'd like to be in a relationship with you. We've got to do that now because I've got some money. <laughs> hang with me, hang with me. And uh, we're going to work together. We're going to at least do this for five years. If I like you, if it works out, maybe we'll do it again. <laughs> That's not a relationship. That's something else I understand. <laughs> That's not a relationship. So the whole idea of building CBPR is really based on this trusting and trustworthy relationship. I will take, I will just say that most university researchers, and I'm absolutely to blame in many cases too, are not necessarily trustworthy. 
Why? Because we never take a class in this. We learn all about statistics. We learn all about sampling. We learn all about you know theoretical you know theories and, and program design. We never actually learn about how you share values to develop relationships. So it really wasn't until I met someone very special, named Marianne Fu. Aww. She, for those of you who don't know her, she's the executive director of the Orange County Asian Pacific Islander Community Alliance. It's called Opathia. I've had the pleasure of working with her, and she has taught me how to better understand and value a CBO PR process. How did that happen? Well, I first met her. So if anyone's actually met Mary Ann, she doesn't come up to you and just say, you're a researcher? I've got some money. We need to work. We're going to work in the next five years. She's not that kind of person. In fact, she's a matchmaker. <laughs> anyone's met her? If you're single, she will try and match you. We were both students at UCLA. I bumped into her in the hallway, didn't know her at all. She didn't know me at all. Took one look at me. I must have looked like I was socially inept because she asked me, Who, hello, what's your name, and would you like to be matched with someone? <laughs> My social life does need some assistance. <laughs> but who are you? <laughs> so what do you mean? So she is a networker, right? She's the kind of person that just reaches out and wants to get to know people before there's ever really a reason for a relationship, an ongoing relationship to happen. Um, so I met her, and it turns out that we actually started collaborating on something called the, the California Pacific Islander, um, Asian Pacific Islanders Tobacco Education Network. It was called Happy Ten. This is years ago. I'm sure it predates most of the people in this room. Um, and we worked together on nothing having to do with research. We actually were working together because we were, um, this network was interested in doing policy advocacy for Asian Pacific Islander issues related to tobacco and, and uh, smoking and passive smoking. So we both served, volunteered on this. We started to get to know each other. We're like, wait a minute. You look at things the same way I do. You know, I kind of like the way the things that you brought up. You know, you're kind of like something, someone who's kind of interesting to me. Let's get to know each other better. Well, we finally decided that you know what, maybe we should actually work together. She at the time was starting Ocapica. I at the time was finishing my PhD. She said, "Sora, would you actually like to come on board and be part of the uh, board of directors of Ocapica?" I said, "Oh my God, you actually trust me to help you run an agency?" Wow, okay, if you'll teach me. So I actually joined, and through uh, working with her on Ocapica, I feel like that was our engagement. We are trying each other out. We had now a few responsibilities to each other, right? This wasn't just about having fun and leaving. Uh, we actually had to get up the next day and figure out, like, can we still work together? We actually could. We actually decided, you know what, there's some, some hard things, but this seems, like, this seems like something could last. So we decided to get married and engage in CVPR research. In the early, um, let's see, it's in 1991, we started a project called Life is Precious, a Hmong breast health study, because uh, Hmong women in, um, primarily, uh, we were learning about in Long Beach, were dying of breast cancer and uh, never going to get screened. And so we worked in collaboration with, at the time I was at UC Irvine, um, Marianne was Ocapica, um, researchers from UCLA, Marjorie Kagawa Singer, and um, three other community-based organizations, um, Stone Soup in Fresno, Families of Good Health in Long Beach, and the Union of Pan-Asian Communities in San Diego got together and said, you know what, let's actually go for funding. Let's actually try and make this baby work. Um, and uh, after that, what we have now is called Weaving an Islander Network for Cancer Awareness Research and Training. This was actually started in 2005. There's a lot of things that happened in between 1991 um, and 2005. But just an example of a current um, project we're doing together, where we're also identifying research um, opportunities, collaborating on data collection, et cetera. So um, our babies are, have been conceived, are growing, and those are our research projects. Um, we've been parenting, and I think we're, we're successful parents. We each have our relative spouses, so we actually include them sometimes. But Marianne and I see a lot of each other. We actually ended up moving um, about 10 years ago. We now live about half a mile away from each other. <laughs> no, you do not need to live very close to your senior <laughs> <laughs> We just do. And um, I, I make it cycle around, because after your parent, don't you have to keep the love alive? Right? The relationships, you gotta start dating again. You gotta start figuring out what's important beyond just the research, just beyond the work. And so 
I, I put the picture of our two sons. This is Matthew, her son, and Saran, my son. Um, they are uh, really good friends, so we oftentimes get together, Marianne and I, just to see our, our children play and you know, to revisit what's important to us. Um, I would say this is, for me, has been the idea. Through Marianne, I have met some wonderful people, Jane and Charlene, um, researchers, community advocates, um, community-based organizations, etc. through this. Um, the take-home message is, get, get fine to Marianne, live very close to her, and get your children to do that. The take-home message is what? When should you, what? Relationships. And when should you start the relationships? Build them, yeah. Build them before you ever have to actually get married and have the child, right? Build it while you still can date and still get to know each other. Now, I will say that CPPR is not just all about that good feeling, right? So this is sort of a, I'm painting a, a pleasant picture and I'm kind of hiding all the things that how you know have gone on, all the struggles that we've had. And they do happen. But what happens when someone who you really respect and you really admire, and you know feels the exact same thing to you, comes up to you and says, or to me and says, no, Sora, you're actually doing things wrong. We're finding this stuff out. We're a little concerned that, Sora, you need to change what you're going to do. So what's the difference between someone who doesn't know you saying that to you versus someone who you are engaged, married, et cetera, saying that to you? more likely to listen, absolutely. And more likely to say like, oh my gosh, please tell me what I'm doing wrong. The good thing now is, hopefully, that I learn all the time what I'm doing wrong. So I'm not a complete idiot because I get a chance to learn <laughs> and be better. And the good thing is that it's two ways. And I'll tell you that um, on the vein of, of um, dissemination and making sure to be involved and collaborat collaborative um, about Three years ago, I had a very, very dear um, researcher, um, community uh, collaborative researcher tell me, um, and she, it, she said this at a meeting, and she broke down crying, um, saying, you know, Sora, I heard that you went and presented our, our research um, without asking, without including, and I just can't believe you would do that. And I said, you know, thank you so much for telling me that, right? If we, were, if we didn't care about each other, you would have never taken the time to share that with me. And if I, you know, if we didn't care about each other, I would not take the time to say, gosh, you know, let's figure out how to make this better. And out of that, we actually came up with a whole other protocol about how to um, adhere to CBPR. Wrote it down, and now the guidelines for everyone to abide to. Right? So this isn't just about a feeling. Right? It certainly starts with the trust, but this is also then taking that feeling and building it into the research plan so that everything is clarified and identified and so that people can follow it right, and um, learn how to do those kinds of steps. Um, so what are some of those ways? Yeah, Lisa. Just a real quick question. Do you develop MOUs or memorandums of understanding in your collaborative relationships with community partners? Absolutely. Um, we've done it in the past, back when we had, this, um, we had this conversation. We actually had a policy in place, but we revisited it and improved it. And just a few months ago, Wincart, our latest um, collaborative, just developed an MOU because we realized that the ways that we were communicating and sharing in decision making weren't as collaborative as it could be. And um, when we get to that, I will be sharing some examples of that. But the first thing I want, do want to say that at minimum, you need some structures in place, right? To be able to say that we are <coughs> equitable researchers <coughs> in this effort. So let me just share with you at least what are some of the mechanisms that are currently um, available. So these are establishing structures. This is a before you even start or while you're starting to develop the um, research um, proposal or project or whatever that you're working on together. First of all, who are the leads? I just talked about the fact that for most research-funded studies, they have what's called principal investigators or co-investigators. These are the people who are directly responsible for carrying out the key scientific 
aims and activities of each study. So at the beginning of this morning, we said about who are the typical researchers, the typical researchers who fulfill principal investigators, other PhDs from universities, etc. How many of you who are, don't have PhDs or who are not from universities, how many of you have been a principal investigator on the study? Two? Yes. Um, how many of you know that you can be principal investigator on studies? <laughs> okay. Is there anything that says in any, and I'm talking to researchers and communities alike, that says that you must have a certain kind of a degree or you must have a certain kind of academic um, uh, background in order to be a principal or, or a co investigator? If you look at National Institutes of Health or CDs or something, they would say we want the lead people to be appropriate, right? So if you're proposing to do a study that involves ADD in the laboratory, you better have someone who's a principal investigator or co-principal investigators who have that kind of background and expertise. But if you're trying to do something that involves evaluating a program as a community, should you have people who are about who are actually program people in that community who understand how to do that program as some of the lead people responsible? If you don't, you're missing some key experts, right? Sorry, I was just going to um, inquire about there are some PIs that you require you to be part of an institution that's academic. So you don't necessarily have to be a PhD, but it has to be affiliated with the university, right? So. Um, and so um, there are some, ins are you talking about some funders or there are some institutions that require that? Okay. So, yes. Um, some institutions like Cal State Fullerton, UC Irvine, in order for you to represent the university, you need to have a certain kind of um, position. You have to be what's considered um, uh, to be uh, appropriate to principal investigate. So all researchers at um, a university are not necessarily um, eligible to be principal investigators, only certain ones. But that's specific to an agency. Might that be true for some of your agencies too? Right? So if you work in uh, county or in hospitals or at, at nonprofit groups, that your agency, your agency also defines sort of who are the people who are eligible or most appropriate. They usually are people who have higher responsibilities in that institution to begin with. Right? So usually volunteers for an organization can't represent that organization as an investigator. But could the executive director? Could the program director? Could a program coordinator? Depending on that agency, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure if the IRB process also um, have an impact on who's going to be a PI or co-PI. Okay, so we're going to talk about institutional report, review boards in a minute, yeah. or in about, hmm, I'd say an hour. Hold that thought, because the, answer, the quick answer is no. It depends on the research study. But let me throw this back to you now, though. So uh, there was two things Mo brought up. One is who can represent your institution or your agency. The second is who does the funder want? Sometimes the funder says that you need to have an appropriate level of expertise, right? So that actually does mean oftentimes that the funder wants to have someone with a PhD, with a, an, an approved track record in that research area. Do they have to be the sole principal investigator? No. And in fact, I will bring up Marianne Thune of Capica. And for years, she is, she has been, ever since, Jackie, how long has, have we had this path? 1999. 1999. And there have been Two iterations with a, well actually three if you count the needs assessment. There was like a one year needs assessment or a two year needs assessment and there was the first five years and the next five years and they've been elongated out. Marianne Fu is the um, principal investigator of that. It's called Promoting Access to Health. It's a Centers for Excellence and Eliminating um, Disparities. It's funded by the CDC. Why is she the most appropriate? It gets down to what the program is about. It's to develop and evaluate community-based interventions to increase breast and cervical cancer screening. So remember, to develop in community settings and evaluate in community settings um, efforts to increase breast and cervical cancer. 
Maranthu is the executive director of Okapika. She's got a master's in public health from UCLA, and she's done um, a lot of community education, evaluation, publication. If you saw her resume, I think you would absolutely agree, perfectly appropriate to be the principal investigator. And I have the um, opportunity to be the co-investigator on that because I bring a certain level of, of expertise, but my expertise is not um, able to be responsible for carrying out the entire effort, just for a piece of it, and I'm part of the evaluation team. Okay. So here's where I want you to start thinking about, <coughs> for the kinds of questions that you're interested in topics, who are the kind of people from your institutions that are, are available, and do they have the kind of experience, expertise, and responsibility to serve in lead positions? If they do, assert that. Most of you are from community-based organizations or service organizations. Turns out that without you, researchers like me couldn't do our research. I am a behavioral scientist. I need communities, people to be part of this. I'm not from the communities that I usually work with, Pacific Islander, for example. I need co-investigators. I know that uh, Kaala is one of our co-investigators. She's a lead on personnel on Wincart for us. Um, now, there are differences between principal investigators and co-investigators that we could talk about those differences, but really it's about the idea of identifying who's the most appropriate. If you're not the most, I mean, if you want to be that kind of person, but you're not quite there yet, what do you need in order to be that person? Do you need institutional support, right, to designation to be that person? Do you need more experience in um, presenting results, right? Maybe you're involved in evaluation. But you need more experience, more publications, more presentations, something to demonstrate that you can be uh, a lead on a research project. So you mean you need more research experience, et cetera. What is it, whatever it is that you need in order to do that, think about it. In the absence of um, principal investigators, co-investigators, what I think are some really other important structures are things like executive boards. So it turns out that most collaborative researchers so have um, not just the lead um, investigative team, so the lead researchers, the lead investigators, but people who are going to be part of the decisions to carry out, to meet the aims of each of the research studies. These are executive level people. These are people who have decision-making powers, and those decisions are essential to carrying out the study. So as part of WinCart, we have um, six community-based organizations, one representative from each of those sits on our, uh, kind of one of our executive bodies, that's called the steering, Center Steering Committee. And every major decision, if we've got leftover money, how should we be spending it? We take it to the Center <coughs> Steering Committee. If we're having a problem meeting a, a, an aim of the study, right, we're having glitches in recruitment or we're having glitches in development of, of, of uh, instruments or collection of data, Center Steering Committee, they are, the, they are helping to make the decisions that run that research project. How many of you have actually sat on any kind of a body like that? Executive boards? No. Great. Fabulous. Okay. And then finally, maybe you don't want to necessarily, or you feel, for, depending on the study, that, that sitting at the day-to-day -day level is not the right role. But you want to be kept abreast of things, right? You want to represent your community to make sure that things are appropriate, are culturally sensitive. Right, are um, involving people in ethical ways and, and cultural, culturally appropriate ways, then oftentimes people think about community advisory boards. This is a lower level collaborative structure, but where you can get representation from community members and stakeholders. You wouldn't just need people from the collaborating agencies, but you could have people who would represent the participants, right? Be involved. They oversee the partnership, they help to guide it, but their suggestions aren't necessarily mandatory, right? Here's just input to improve. And they can help to ensure that the two-way flow of communication happens between all the research and the community. And on WinCart, we actually have something called the Community Advisory Group. They're made up of representatives that aren't directly involved in all the research activities. But they're from the community, so we've got pastors, we've got cancer survivors who are involved. Right? They don't want to come to every meeting we have, but we have quarterly meetings where they get to learn about what we've been doing, they get to share their advice on what we think can be doing better, and then we can ask them things like, how would the community react? We want to share this back. How can we be re-engaging with our survivors or our participants? 
How many of you have been on an advisory board? Community advisory board. Oh, I was hoping much more. Okay. So you know then that your, your input is not binding, that researchers don't have to follow it, but if they're smart, they will. Right. Are there other, I, I'm sensing that there are probably other, are there other entities that people have served on before on collaborative structures? Yes. Like action groups for specific parts. Okay. Work groups or action groups for specific things. Okay, and would they, do they form more on the level of guidance, these action groups, or more on the level of decision making? Actually, they're more on the level of Great, absolutely. Perfect. Anyone else been involved with anything else? Yeah. Uh, collaborative for Children's Oral Health. Okay. Um, what it is, it's different clinics in the community that provide services to children, and we get a lot of input about what needs to be done differently, how community clinics can function more efficiently, how we can decrease the decay level in children under the age of five. Good. Have you ever taken on any research kind of efforts before? They have a researcher. We have a research institution that we go to, um, and I know we did get the research results from last year. Um, and what we did is we came up with a new set of questions that we want them to be looking at. Oh, good. So it sounds kind of like you're here at the level of an advisory board. You kind of are a sounding board for people, yeah. right? Offer input, but they don't necessarily have to act on everything that you provide. Well, kind of. Oh, I like that. So we pay them. And there's certain things that we work for the Children and Families Commission, so there's certain things that they're looking for that we need to provide them. Excellent. Okay, so you really are more at the level of you are in charge, you're doing a subcontract or a consultant agreement to someone, they are kind of taking your ideas and, and actually working on it. Yes. So I would say you're probably functioning as sort of the investigators, and they're the hired right? researcher to do it. Love it. Anyone actually played that role before? Where you're actually, okay, so you, you've been at more at the institutional level, trying to figure out, I mean, trying to define what needs to get done, and then bringing on expertise to do it. Okay. So the whole idea, though, that there are different um, roles. When should you negotiate? Who should be an uh, um, investigator? Or when should you, you should negotiate to have or not have a community advisory board? At the very beginning. At the very beginning, right? So you don't wait for after you've had the child to say, now who is going to make a decision? about <laughs> whether we're going to breastfeed or not, or who was going to make the decision about whether it's public school or private school, right? This happens at engagement and marrying, right? Right, because really it's at the marriage stage that you're like, okay, you're the principal investigator, I'm the co-investigator, I understand what my role is, I understand what your role is, now let's go have the baby together, right? Okay. Um, let's see, so I guess I want to, okay, maybe we can do this. Um, so now you're, you've developed your relationship. Let's just say you're all in loving relationships now with university community researchers. <laughs> <laughs> and now's the time that you have to actually figure out what you want to do together, right? Now, I'm just going to throw out a few things that you might want to consider. Things like, is the issue consistent with the long-range goals of the community? Right? Do you want to be working on this issue five years from now, ten years from now? It, will the issue be unifying? Will it make people want to work together? Or will it be divisive? Like, it'll turn people against each other because it's going to find out that like, your program works, but your program doesn't work. Right? Um, will the issue contribute to community capacity building? Will the process of CBRPR provide good education experience for everyone involved? Will the community receive credit? What kind of credit? Are you going to receive credit in name? Are you going to see credit in terms of resources, et cetera? Will CBPR lead to an improved health or social outcome? And is the issue important enough for people to work on? And are they willing to work on it? So I wanted to just take this time to go through a little exercise. Um, what I'm going to do is pass out, let's see, how about groups of six? What, ooh, no, we should probably have you guys turn and look at each other, right? So, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so kind of turn around and face the group. I'm going to give each group um, a scenario. I want you to read through the scenario and to try and figure out what process would you use 
to answer each of the questions. Okay? Uh, we'll give each other, each other maybe about 10 minutes to go through the three questions. I think I should do that. And then we'll come from um, reconvening. So, the first group, I only have two copies for each group. Your scenario number one. Are you guys, are you one big group? Excellent. I heard two ideas. Survey, generally quantitative. Town hall meeting. A lot of good qualitative information. Are those two very valid um, options to collect information? Yes. And are they using research? Absolutely. Good. What else? What else did you need to do? I think the other way is to call out focus group discussions. Yeah, to get all information. Because you might not be able to approach people door to door. And then the only way you also collect information is to conduct focus group discussions. Good. So focus groups, even key informants, right? You don't necessarily have to have a group of people, but if you have key experts or people who have experienced this that you can talk to. Now, do you need large numbers to try and figure out how to do this? No. No. Right? I've done research studies where we've interviewed 20 people. 20 people, I got three years of funding to do this. 20 people, it was all around um, breast cancer um, survivorship. So actually, those 20 interviews were really in depth. But we're not talking big numbers. We're talking about what's the research, you know, what do you want, what do you want to get accomplished? Number two, how will you determine what topics promote larger community capacity building? The survey. The survey would tell us what the needs are of the community. So the survey is going to tell you, for example, that you are there's a huge need to prevent accidents, to do education around something, right, for, to prevent accidents, etc. How do you know if that's actually going to lead to community capacity building if you prevent accidents? It'll lead to reduced accidents, maybe. But how will it? How will you know if it increases community capacity? Identify what the what the resources available in the community and build on that resources and have the community member actively involved and utilize the existing. And then as a partner, we see the gap in the community, we together I put all the resources to meet together. Wow, I should have written that down. That was brilliant. So, <laughs> but essentially what you're saying is, not only is the research going to identify the need, I mean, uh, the research part is going to identify the need, like um, injury prevention. But it's everything else you know that's going to try and figure out what to do with that information, right? So before you even collect the needs assessment, shouldn't you have a good idea who might even use this information? <laughs> Let me put it a different way. If there was no community agencies that were interested in um, accidents and injuries, should you ask it on your needs assessment? Not necessarily, right? Because how does it link to anything that the community can actually work on? On the other hand, if you know that your community agency and, and, and population is very interested in breast cancer, right? But, you know, maybe the researcher is not that interested in breast cancer. Would you want to make sure that breast cancer is on your needs assessment? Absolutely. Right? So it's, it's not just about what the science says you need to look at, but it's who's going to use the information. I think exactly what you said. Perfect. Okay, what roles should the, um, what should the roles of the community versus the university researchers be in the selection of the topic? Let's say I'm the researcher and I want to do tobacco. And let's say no one's interested in tobacco. Well, good morning. It's the 13th of March. <laughs> good morning. In the community uh, room this morning, we have a partnership with UC Irvine. <laughs> and in the afternoon, the Children's Program, St. Patrick's Day Program. <laughs> 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 Okay, so number three, what should the roles of the community versus the university researchers be in the selection of the topic? Should it just be the researchers selecting it? What happens if the researcher says, you know what, that's not, or that's a great idea, but that's not my area of expertise? There you go. It's collaborative. Opportunities for new researchers. Yay, love this group. Number two, testing new interventions. Who are my tip number two groups? Number two, and number two, and number two. Okay, so you've been asked to join a research collaborative that is writing a grant proposal to develop and test the effectiveness of a new program. Oh, I picked the topic, childhood obesity. The research is being led by a group of university researchers, and the goal of the first meeting is to identify the strategies to include in the program. Number one, how will you determine what populations 
to target a proposal? Look at the data of uh, sections or target the, the schools that have an obesity problem. Look at the data that exists at the school districts. Good. So you're going to look at the data. And let's say that the data says that you should be targeting some other groups that you don't serve. the highest level of obesity but still a need, should we be including my populations? Yes. Is it an important uh, role of community to assert that mm -hmm. and to change that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Number two, who should identify the strategies that should be included in the program? Oh, this should be us. Yeah. Everyone. Mm -hmm. In particular, the communities, people who are actually serving and providing the services, right? Mm -hmm. And three, how will you determine if the resulting research study is of a, enough interest to you to be part of. Remember, because this is you're writing a grant proposal. What things are you going to look for to decide if you want to be part of this or not? Good. Sub interest. Yeah. It's going to take into account your reporting back to the agency if they're even going to be able to commit to what the grant proposal is requesting. So, what is it going to take from your agency to actually be part of this? Does it move your mission forward? Oh, I love it. Does it actually move your mission forward? We have so much need, we could be spending our entire lives, we are spending our entire lives addressing all the needs, right? But what are the things that you feel is gonna best reflect what you're there to do? Great, and there's a big fourth one. <laughs> and what is it about money? Do you have the resources? And if you're writing a grant proposal, what kind of resources should you be looking for? Stuff? Or should I say staff? staff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Staff. Okay, so a general rule in CBPR is that the money should follow the actual leadership and emphasis of, about what that research is doing. Turns out universities are very costly. But are we worth our money? <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. It turns out more likely communities, your staff, the staffing, is less money. So that the automatic assumption is you need less support. But that's not always true because it's not just staffing that you need, right? Sometimes it's, it's infrastructure to your agency, right? Because you need to report to your board of directors, to your other staff members, to your clients. Sometimes it's a lot of travel. I have staff members who say, I can get reimbursed for travel. I'm like, yes, you're doing something outside of the services of your agency, right? So where's the money and are you getting the money that you need to do this? Okay, and um, then quickly, um, number three, evaluating existing programs. You're very interested in determining whether existing programs work in your community work. Um, you set up a meeting, invite other staff from your agency, staff from our organization, and some researchers. Thank you. The goal of this meeting is to define the main topic of the evaluation study and figure out whether there's any funding to support it. So number one, again, who should define what program should be evaluated? Oh yes, this is all community, right? How can staff members from different agencies collaborate on such an evaluation? Mm. MOUs. MOUs? Oh, please say you're thinking oh, investigators. You thinking about anyone being an investigator in this one? Who's our, first of all, who's our scenario number three group? Anyone? Yeah. Okay. I don't know where you're going with that. Okay. So, so, uh, Sorry, who should define what programs can be evaluated and then how staff from different groups can collaborate? So this isn't just about, see, as service providers and as collaborators, we all be like, sure, I'll help you. And we never have the conversation, well, what's the role? What's my role? Oh, you want to reach out to the communities I serve? Someone from my institution needs to be an investigator, right? Because that means responsibility for carrying out significant parts of the study. I'm hoping you would say something like that. <laughs> and you're saying, sure. <laughs> and number three, what should the roles of the agency staff versus the university researcher? So in this case, does the university researcher need to be anywhere among an investigator? Maybe. Sure. Maybe, maybe co-investigator. Maybe have a research advisory committee. Right? Have a group of researchers be involved to advise you on how to do the evaluation. Flip it. 
right? That led to what I serve on with Marianne Fuin on her path project. Okay, we talked a little bit about how to now start identifying questions, right? Who should be at the table? What should you be talking about? Whose perspective should inform um, developing questions? And I get questions all the time. What makes a good research question? I don't think I've ever heard a bad research question. Does my program work? Is a great evaluation question. Right? So I've never heard of a bad question. It's really about, as a team, trying to figure out how the question matches the design and method. So this is what we're going to talk a little bit now. Is there are different ways to go about doing research. And I'll apologize ahead of time to the people who are researchers because this is going to be a way simplistic approach. And I'll also apologize to those of you in the community who want to know a lot more about this because unfortunately we don't have the time today to talk about it. But I always like to at least point out that there are two different ways to do research. One is what we call inductive. Um, it's more about we're not sure why something is going on in a community. We need to understand before we even pose a hypothesis like, you know, or pose a research question like, does my program work? Or, you know, program A works better than program B, which is a hypothesis. I hypothesize that. I need to figure out what's going on. This is the kind of work I love to do. For example, with that study I did with 20 um, breast cancer survivors, we just wanted to know. Bless you. What were the needs? What were their experiences? These were Samoan, um, so Pacific Islander um, breast cancer survivors. We had no idea of what their needs were. We had some inkling because there was a support group. But we didn't know as they experienced needs, who were they going to support if they were getting support? What were the experiences of the people who were supporting them? What did they get met in the community or at the hospital? What did they not get? This is very inductive. We need to be thinking about why this even exists before we even identify a hypothesis. We consider this an enic view in anthropology, right? It's in trying to get an insider's view on why these issues or challenges are occurring, right? We want it to be about figuring out how people, what is occurring in a lived reality, in a natural environment. No comparison. No laboratory, just going out there and trying to understand all the different factors at play. Mm -hmm. It's usually more linked to qualitative methods, although you can do um, inductive research with quantitative as well. You can do a lot of inductive research with quantitative, but usually lends itself to qualitative to understand the why is it happening, the context in it, which is happening, right? Um, and then to understand what might be able to make it, to address it. Um, so qualitative methodology like focus groups that Bud and I have talked about, like town hall meetings, getting people together and sharing um, opinions, like inter key informant interviews, going to quote experts, whoever those experts are in the community, to find out what they think is going on. All those different kinds of ways to get help. This is as opposed to what we usually think oftentimes in research is deductive. It means that we know why a problem exists, and we want to actually do something about it and generate a hypothesis. I think my program will do a better job at improving whatever it is that we want to do. Right? I want to know um, whether it does. And then I want to take an outsider view. I, here's my program. I want to take a step, a few steps back, and take an edict, what they call an edict perspective in anthropology. Or as from a few steps away, what's going on with that pro program, right? How is it impacting the people who are involved? Right? How does it compare to other programs in terms of the relative effectiveness? You want to then, instead of taking an iterative approach where you go into the community and then understand what's happening and constantly identify issues and then question whether I'm, I mean, I'm getting the full picture, you want to take a few steps back and take a linear approach. First, you define the program. Then you define the comparison. Then you define the measures, et cetera, right? It's a, very, it's a much more linear approach to research. And it's much more conducive to quantitative, although anthropologists will argue you can do a lot of hypothesis testing, right? Um, anthropologists, sociologists, um, psychologists, 
qualitatively, but it's more likely to be quantitative, to look at what's going on, measuring what's going on, measuring how much change is happening. And those measurements usually happen through quantitative measures, like surveys, right? In fact, everyone always thinks about surveys the first time. What other ways can you quantify things? Yeah? You can count things, like in behavioral health, the number of hospitalizations. Bingo. You can go to data that's already collected, either by surveys or by observations like disease cases, and count how many people don't have health insurance, or how many people who had health insurance had a positive outcome, right? Quantitative. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you're collecting data all from scratch. In fact, survey data collection is oftentimes some of the hardest data collection to do, right? Because of all the labor that goes into surveys. Okay, so we just talked about this. Quantitative usually involves measurements of some kind. Instruments like questionnaires or surveys or observations, right? Could I, for example, if I had a standardized tool and I wanted to know what the effectiveness of this workshop was, find out, I'll check the number of people, how many people are sleeping, <laughs> how many people are nodding their hand, how many people are interacting, can I quantify that? Absolutely. Wide range of methods, right? And I've already talked about qualitative. I could observe people in the natural setting, in-depth interviews, focus groups, case studies. I could do surveys, but they're more like the open-ended surveys. Like, why did you, what did you feel when you were diagnosed with breast cancer? What did you do next, right? Open-ended, where they can explain. Okay. I do want to say that by, side by side, they differ. I'm not going to go over this in detail, but um, uh, as to what they're um, able to address and how they're able to address different kinds of research questions. So certain of them are uh, qualitative, much better to identify phenomenon going on, going on in the community. But both qualitative and quantitative can describe what's going on in a population. Both of them can explain or can associate things together. Quantitative is usually what you're going to use to predict something. So if I do program A, then participant will, this will happen. It's usually more linear, usually more quantitative, and both of them can be used equally well for, for a program evaluation, depending again on what you want to get out of it. So um, hopefully, um, in the future, you'll never ask the question like, well, what kind of survey do we need to do, right? Or what kind of, it's not, it shouldn't be about the method, it's always about what do you want to answer? And what's the best way to do this? Getting into people's lives or taking a step back and trying to see, observe, a little bit more from outside the moment. That's the way that, that um, is uh, generally how you want to think about it. Okay. What I, I want to talk about, though, is more likely than not, in CBPR, we use a <coughs> combination of methods. Because it turns out that when you're working with people in communities, right, there is the lived experience that's important to capture as much as there is something about programmatically or impacts that you do want to understand, right? You want to know if you're making a decision. <coughs> I'm going to show you this messy picture now. And it just means that you can do mixed methods, a combination of qualitative and quantitative in all sorts of different ways. There's no right or wrong. And if a researcher said, you have to do it this way, well, then they're wrong. For instance, if you're, um, if you're really looking, you're trying to really understand something going on in a community or something going on in a program, you're not quite sure what's going on yet. It's what they call formative a step, right? You might want to first have a town hall meeting and say, you know, what do people think about this program? Right? Who's interacting? Find a few people who've been part of the program, interview them. What has been your experience? Qualitative. And then based on the feedback that you get from all those different kinds of qualitative methods, design a survey that you can then administer to all the participants in a program to then figure out right, whether that, what's going on with that program. So qualitative can come first, then quantitative, then the results. But sometimes you get results. You have, you know, like, you know what? I know that my, uh, that my, uh, uh, service is, is preventing or is, is uh, reducing mortality. My breast cancer program is reducing mortality. Why? Because we have quantitative data that shows that people are living. But I don't know why. Right? Then it's like, well, we need to figure out why that's working. 
Well, then we'll want to go out and do um, interviews or qualitative assessments with people to figure out, well, what is it about this program and what we're doing well? Why did it work so well? And it can help you to explain the results. Right? And a lot of times people call this the validity step, right? the external validity step. You know that your results worked in a controlled population, but now you want to figure out if it's actually working and how well it's working out there in the community. You can do a nested. So you can start with qualitative, go to quantitative, right, get results. You can then go, you can, <laughs> okay, this is not trying to cycle all the way back. And it really depends. You could do quantitative, then qualitative, then quantitative, et cetera. It really depends on what you're trying to figure out at which time. Or you can do pa parallel. You know, I'm more of a quantitative researcher. You're more of a qualitative researcher. We both want to figure out if this program's working. Let's do it separately and figure out, are we, are our findings in agreement? Right? You could do it at the same time, parallel, and collect, collect rich sources, sources of data in either way. So there is no one way is better than another. It all depends on what kind of thing you're trying to answer at the end. Does that make sense? Let me give you an example. And the example I want to give you is something called photo voice and it involves GIS mapping. So very un, um, unsurveyed like. And uh, the goal of this project was, I'm sorry, the goal, the goal of this project was to actually capture the experiences of youth living in Long Beach. And what they felt about smoking, we want to know. What do you think influences your smoking? So it's exploratory. Yeah. So you say capture what? Capture, youth? capture what youth in Long Beach felt was influencing their smoking. Well, we knew what surveys was telling them, us. Surveys tell us that essentially it's the peers, it's the friends. Right, so if your friends smoke, you smoke. It doesn't really help us that much in terms of going out and doing a lot about it. There were already a lot of education going on to, to educate teens about smoking in this area. We wanted to know more. So we did something called Photo Voice. And Photo Voice is um, where you involve people to record and um, reflect their community strengths and concerns for taking photographs. Very qualitative. Um, once they collect the photographs, they take the photographs, they dialogue with each other about what's the meaning of those photographs. Right? What are the issues that they're seeing? And then finally, um, once we do that, we want to make sure that those photographs are then used to educate other people about uh, what's found. Um, let's see. So we did this in Long Beach. And this is the quantitative. We actually had people um, go and take pictures of various things. We uh, recruited, uh, what is that, 20 youths? They went, we, uh, we trained them on use cameras, they went out to their communities, and we just said, take pictures of anything you believe influences smoking among youth in this community. And this is what they, and then we quantified the findings. We found out that most of them felt like advertisement targeting teens. There were a lot of pictures of advertisement. Um, <coughs> targeting teens particularly. And certainly advertising, uh, advertising um, set, uh, targeting the community in general. But they also felt that, you know what, just the appearance of the community and the safety, the trash, the et cetera, in the community also affects. And they felt business, making money off of the community, is affecting um, youth. Um, violence and poverty. If I just showed you this, would you get a lot out of that? But this is quantitative <coughs> data. I've got an, a sample size of 37. This is good stuff. I can do statistical <coughs> analyses with this. Eh. Now what you really want to see are things like this, right? So here's a picture of, and you can't tell, but it's a targeting youth because it's the, the musical group, The Roots. And it's actually on the door of a um, uh, convenience store. It has The Roots promoting cool. And so why is this important? The youth said in Long Beach that they add for cool cigarettes and a singing group called The Roots, and The Roots basically sp um, supporting smoking. They're cool spokespeople. I took the picture because cigarette brands are making are using famous people to influence their audience. This photo concerns me because if more famous people are becoming spokespersons, then they will get the attention of younger audiences like the teen, like teenagers. Because Lord knows I didn't know who the Roots were, <laughs> but every single one of the teens did. Concern, eye level, the minute you walk into a convenience store, this is what they see. What about this? We saw a lot of pictures of things like this. This is also in Long Beach. 
Driving by the ditch, people can see all the graffiti and the litter. Graffiti is in a, in a neighborhood and it's gang related. All the litter and graffiti makes Long Beach look bad. We should make a place they can tag and start a gang prevention program. We should pick up trash and paint out the graffiti. They felt that because kids every day saw this, no wonder that they want, they don't care about themselves because no one cares about the community. They don't care about what they smoke. Right? And then, um, this is poverty. This is actually up in Richmond. The first thing I noticed with this man who's smoking a cigarette, this, this um, homeless man actually asked the kids who were taking the pictures for a cigarette. Wow. But what's really happening is he has nothing to do with his life except smoke. He's asked us for money for a cigarette. This relates to my life because, because we have to struggle to get things. This exists because our community has so much poverty, etc. They felt that the poverty was what um, influenced people's money. So if you took a step back, would you say, yeah, poverty, trash, community, um, pride, etc.? Could those things impact people? Absolutely. Then what we did was we actually asked this um, youth to show us where all these locations were. This is Long Beach, and um, this is the 710 Freeway, and this is ooh, uh, Pacific Coast Highway. Thank you. Um, every uh, red dot is the location of something they found um, influenced them to smoke. So locations of mini markets, locations of ditches, locations of et cetera. Every green dot was location of something that actually would prevent them from smoking. Um, community centers, um, community service organizations, hospitals, et cetera. And what we found is in a very concentrated area, and they went to, yeah, about this kind of geographic area, really centering around some of the major thoroughfares is where if we wanted to do anything, we should concentrate our efforts, right? To, to change how the community looked and what, what they, I'm dead. Uh, I think this is in Northern California. Whoopsie. I took the break. So what do we do with that? So what would you do with this? If you got the information, this was more, we wanted to know about what was going on. So we found out what affects youth, besides the fears, and we found out where all these things are located. What, what do you think we could do with this? We go to those areas and we see how we can improve, uh, get rid of the litter and the graffiti and have them improve poverty in that area. And certainly the first thing you can do is with the advertisers and get those to change. Bingo. So what the youth actually said is after they took a look at all these things, that they really want to do something for all the vendors that were um, uh, located in this area. And actually, the first thing they decided to do was to do a vendor to support a new vendor licensing law. So it turned out that they had no way to force vendors, you know, people who sell cigarettes, to move things or change things because you know, they didn't have a, a law in place that, for that city. There were things that were for the larger county, but for that city that said that they shouldn't be, right, um, selling to minors, that they should have um, things that are, et cetera, locations, et cetera. And, and in order to um, influence vendors, they wanted to make sure that the city council, the local city council, was on board and wanted to make these changes among the vendors themselves. So what they did was they actually took these pictures, and they had, you know, dozens of these pictures. They took them, put them all on a big board and took them to the local um, city council meeting and actually said, these things are happening and are affecting us. These are all the ads and the set of the locations. We want to do something about it. Please pass. And now, it wasn't just them, but they did help to pass a, a vendor licensing law in uh, specifically for Long Beach. And now they're going through enforcement. They're doing a lot of training around um, use of photo voice now for the next step with, with use, of, et cetera. Um, this was a funded research study. Three years from the California Tobacco Research, um, TRDRT, Tobacco Related Disease Research Program. Three year funding, I was a co investigator with the executive director from a nonprofit organization. We actually had three other nonprofit organizations involved um, all across the, in California and in Washington, um, state of Washington. So it had never been done before. In, for me, it's very meaningful because obviously, you know, they get to use this information. Um, okay. Knowing that we have only, let me just check my notes because I want to make sure we have enough time to do some things. Um, I think we can probably go through, I'm going to kind of breeze through this next example of wind cart. 
I think it elevates some of the concerns that we've talked about today. I think I'll do it in like literally around the world in wind part in five minutes. <laughs> Are you ready? Okay. So I talked to you already that we, I have a, um, a project called WinCart. It's uh, Weaving an Island Network for Cancer Awareness Research and Training. Orange, um, the OCAPICA is involved as a, other five other nonprofit organizations. Ka'awa with Pacific Island Health Partnership is one of our um, uh, collaborators as well. We're in the business of trying to reduce cancer disparities among Pacific Islanders through increasing education, increasing research, and increasing training of the next generation of researchers. We've gotten funding for a large amount of time. We're very, very lucky. Everyone always asks, where are the Pacific Islands? The people that we um, work with in Southern California, of which there are 100,000 Pacific Islanders in Southern California, come from all across the Pacific, many of them including um, uh, Guam, the Northern Mariana and Islands, and the Marshall, Isle Marshall, Mar Marshall Islands, Hawaii. This is what happens when I try to go too fast. Slow down. Uh, Tonga and Samoa, not uh, uh, American Samoa, not uh, Western Samoa. And I said that there were 100,000. Uh, this is in California, though. This slide just shows you that for every single indicator of need, Pacific Islanders have them. Lower, um, higher levels of people without um, education, um, health, high school education compared to the white, non-Hispanic whites. Um, p greater percentages of people at 100% poverty line or less compared to non-Hispanic whites, etc. Every single, every single year. And um, we've been um, in this business for many years now, so we've actually worked with more than just six new based organizations. Here's a list of all the groups and researchers from more than just my um, institution. So we're, we're really, really lucky to be able to work with some amazing partners. And we collaborate on CPPR all the time. So I just want to remind you, here are the steps. Let's see how they work. First, identifying the research topic. So it turned out that um, three years ago, Wincart partners, um, all the partners in Water Wincart, decided that we wanted to do a Wincart-wide community education effort on something to reduce cancer disparity. Huge, right? What should we do? Wincart already had in place scientific um, advisory board, a community advisory board, and for everything that we do, we always develop a working group made up of both. So we already knew we were going to go through this structure. Right? So this is not about initiating the, the relationship. This is about making the marriage work. Okay, so I bet most of you would say the first thing we should do is look at the data, right? Among Pacific Islanders in California, the top five cancers for men, California versus Los Angeles prostate, then lung, colorectal, stomach. For leukemia for California, but for Los Angeles is bladder cancer. For females, Pacific Island females, shouldn't be surprising, breasts, number one. Uterus or lung, depending on which area, lung or cervix, colorectal, cervix or stomach, and this is numbered one through five. Pretty much any cancer you want, any of the major cancers, are cancers of need in Pacific Islanders. Uh, does that help you? Yeah. You've narrowed it down to these top 10 cancers then, right? Oh, it's still a lot. Well, we should go to the community, right? And ask, what cancers do you see of need? And what, what cancers do you think the community wants to target? So the community leaders um, told us, you know what? We want to identify cancers that affect both men and women. Okay, that should rule out breast and prostate then. Phenomenal cancers, right? Because this only affects men and this only affects women. And we wanted to do, do one large campaign. Breast doesn't only affect women. That's uh, true. Thank you men. very much, Chris. Very much. So 10, 5 to 10% 10 of the cases does affect men, but not a major one. So any campaign targeting breast would primarily be reaching women, um, rather than reaching um, people relatively more equally. Um, so the community said both men and women. And they said they want a strong prevention focus. A cancer that we can actually try and prevent because right, we want to get early in the disease. We don't want to, I mean, right? And the issue, we don't want to wait until people are dying. Which tends to eliminate um, breast, I mean prostate, we don't really know of good ways to prevent it. Breast, we do know some, <coughs> but back then it was a lot less. Um, lung, we actually do know a lot about preventing, right, through smoking. Um, cervical, we actually do know a lot. 
through um, pap test, but it only affects women, so now we're back to flow. Stomach, mm, less known, that's more about the, a, a virus. A colorectal, we do know a lot. So lung and colorectal affect both men and women, right? And prevention, strong prevention purpose. We went back to our scientific advisory board. They said, don't touch those issues with a 10 foot pole. Tobacco, very, very hard to address. Mm -hmm. Colorectal, you can try and prevent it, but if you actually want to find people who need diagnosis, very, very hard, hard to diagnose. You're either taking people to get a colonoscopy or a sigmoidoscopy, which is invasive and expensive, or a fecal occult blood test, which is highly problematic, high um, po uh, false positives. We went back to our community, and they said, we said, you know what? The scientists don't want us to touch any of those issues with, you know, because it's too difficult. And our community said, I should probably talk, turn to Kaala, because she probably told the story much better. But the community basically told us, that's the reason why we want to address them. If we don't, who will? Bingo, that's what we decided. So, we set the research question. Can an educational program increase in this case, we said colorectal cancer screening among Pacific Islander adults, but we do have messages around prevention in there. We just, um, when we started to talk about what we really wanted to do, so that let's first get people to screenings. There is a prevention focus of screening, because if you get people into colonoscopy and polyps or family can be removed before they ever um, become cancer. Okay, so we've gone through step two, perfect. Step three, the research team. We got representatives from our community partners, our scientific advisors, and, and that should say, when Art, not win art, staff <laughs> to form the work group with their role being to develop this campaign and keep everyone involved in the, re in the win card network um, uh, apprised of what's going on. And we developed it. We developed a flip chart, a bookmark, and a video. Um, a uh, quick story on the video. Um, I won't show it to you, but you can actually see it on YouTube. Oh, actually, this is a brief. Is this a brief one? No. no, you know what? I won't. I won't pull it up. But I just want to tell you a quick story that we had. We had some money set aside for the materials, but the community told us they said, you know, actually, the best way to pass knowledge on between community part members is by telling stories, by telling our stories, particularly from the people who would be most meaningful. In this case, our cancer survivors. Right? We, at the time, didn't know a lot of cancer survivors. You know, we knew some, but not a lot. But we said, okay, if we can find survivors, and if we can figure out how to do this, we'd love to do a video. But how do you come up with the, anyone know how much videos cost to, to, do, to develop? A lot. Right? 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars right to do a good video. And we said we have Zippo. Can we even find a, a director, a producer, editor who would be willing to do this for a zero? If it was just their university, no one would do this. Because, but it, because it was the community, where we went through our networks, we actually found someone, worked for Roy, Royce Multimedia, who twice a year take on pro bono um, video projects. They did it because they believed in the community and our cause, primarily because one of their staff members is Tongan. So she made the case. So we would have never gotten, it's all about leveraging resources, right? That we would have never gotten unless we had actually used CPPR. We developed this. We said, great, phew, our work is done, right? Did we answer our question? No, we didn't. So we've got actually, well, I should back up and say, we went through the whole, the usual processes to actually develop the materials, right? We wanted to make sure that they were developed appropriately and culturally tailored that the reading level for everything was appropriate, that we did in-language focus groups to make sure that everything we developed, including the, the content, the pictures, the color, the language, everything is understandable and appropriate. Right? Those are just the things that we need to go through. And then we decided to, we set up the study. We said, we're going to work to lay leaders because this has got to be community sustainability and capacity building. We would develop pre and post workshop surveys to assess changes in knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors. And because we wanted to test if ours was worked, we wanted to compare it to something else. Well, it turned out, and I didn't tell you this, but could you guess, was there anything involved going on in the community before this on colorful cancer education? Hey, no. 
So were we as a CBPR going to go out and do education and compare it to people who never got educated? Why would, why, why would that be a problem? Because normally, if you want to compare it, you're at work, you want to compare it to a group that's not getting what you're doing, right? In clinical research, that's called usual care, right, or the control group. The control group gets what's out there. You don't deny anything to them. You just don't give them the better thing that you've got. In the case where nothing exists, what's the usual care? Can we, as CBPR researchers, give our communities who participate in this nothing? We're going to ask for a survey from them, right? We're going to ask them to tell us stuff about, are we going to give them nothing? We have to give them something, right? So we actually created another brochure. And we based it off of the Cancer Information Services What You Need to Know series about colorectal cancer. This is available on the web. Download it for free. We did translate it <coughs> into Pacific Islander languages, right? But now what we're going to do is we're going to compare what we created, the video, the flip chart, the bookmark, et cetera, to something that is available off of the web. We did translate it though, so now it's more available. But this is stuff that should be available to communities, right? We're not going to leave them with nothing. Okay, so I'm going to leave you in suspense about what we found. Isn't that mean of me? I will flash out that we did collect pre and post tests to track changes between them. And we did find increases in um, our group. We found increases in the comparison group as well, right? Because we're educating everyone. If you're the, so if you were part of this, who would you hope you found the, the bigger increases among? The tailored group, right? The group that got our video and everything, and we did find the increase, higher increases in that. But I won't bore you with all that data. The big thing is we found the increases. Now what are we going to do with it? So we decided that, you know what, since we know this works, we want to actually develop materials to um, disseminate to others. And it's available now on our website. We created a toolkit. And um, you can actually go to our website, this wincart.fullerton.edu, not only get the toolkit, this is all the PDF form, you can get all our materials. They've all been translated. You can get the bookmark. The video is obviously on YouTube for free. You can get our pre and post tests, our consent forms, because yes, we have to go through consent, and we're going to talk about consent in just a minute, and our evaluation, all our evaluation forms are all available. So that never, and if you want to just look at it to see how you can do something like this, I invite you to go there. Oh, so, right, wincart.bulletin.edu. Okay, so I'm going to skip this, because we already took a break. <laughs> And fast forward, because that example should have raised some issues around ethics, right? What is ethical to give to communities? Or what is ethical to deny to communities in the sake of research? I want to show you this. I think that's already So what I'm going to show you is a video about it's called Blood Journey. For those of you who might have heard, the Havasupai Indians in um, Arizona participated in a research study about diabetes. Mm -hmm. Little did they know that their information was actually used for other things. This gives you a little bit of an example of what they found, or what they, what they experienced. Mm -hmm. They took my mom and my dad. And I was 19 years old when they took my blood. Blood has deep spiritual meaning to the Havasupai. Many people obtain degrees, um, and what did we get? Nothing. Carletta Toulouse was one of the very few members of her tribe to attend college. In 2003, while a student attending a dissertation reading, she was shocked to discover that her tribal blood samples had been the basis for studies beyond diabetes research. All sorts of studies that were um, harmful to our reputation, Researchers had looked at their blood for possible genetic markers for schizophrenia and had studied patterns of inbreeding. An anthropological study traced the tribe's ancestral migration from Asia, which contradicted their religious beliefs that they'd originated in the canyon. 
a strange person whom I never saw before, taken a part of our bodies, and he finds out that we came from elsewhere. It hurts. Bloodvile sat in this freezer during a seven-year legal battle with the university until Tuesday when the Arizona State Budget Committee approved a cash payment to the tribe in the return of any remaining blood. We could do some kind of a big ceremony. For they deserve their blood back and they deserve closure. My heart cries because I know they're out there and I know they want to come home, my relatives, my friends. It is an acknowledgement that could have broad implications for genetic researchers. My main worry is that the research data will be used in ways that directly hurt the research subjects, uh, but it will be used in ways that they don't agree with. Hank Greeley is the director of the Center for Law and the Biosciences at Stanford University. But it's not just the Havasupai. It's a situation with thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of us across the country. Clorando Ukwala has held on to her ancestors' way of life. I make baskets. I climb the rocks. I go down by the river and collect my sticks. See, this is too fresh. It's not the right time yet. Yes, I have diabetes. I have diabetes. My mom had diabetes. My dad had diabetes. My grandpa, my grandma on my dad's side, my great grandma, my grandma on my mom's side. I wanted that cure. I wanted that. Where, why so long? While it is clear that some tribe members signed a consent form for a study of, quote, behavioral and medical disorders, they say they never understood that their blood would be used to study anything but diabetes. I understand the scientist's perspective on this, and I share it to some extent. People are desperate to get more data, to get more samples. I think if we want people to give their samples to be used for a very wide range of projects, we should tell them up front. But we shouldn't say, we're going to do it to study this disease, paren, and other things, close paren, and then use it for all the other things. And we fought for many years to obtain the samples back, back to this village, back to the families, back to the deceased. Because that's the way of, of our ancestry, that we honor and respect them, no matter what, if it's not their body, it's their blood. Twenty years after they first gave blood, Members of the Havasupai tribe have traveled 300 miles to retrieve it. The university is paying them $700,000 and returning their blood. research that was done. Technically. Technically. I mean, we're talking down to the minuscule, like, fine lines here. Technically, no. And it turns out that there are some um, assurances about um, the conduct of human research. That all research has to go through what's called an institutional review board. Right? 
as my friend, you talked about this before. And that IRB is in place in order to, um, you know, reviews the scientific design and it approves it. And we want to make sure it promotes informed and voluntary participation by, and I hate this word, subjects. That's IRB terminology, not mine. But about anyone involved in research. In particular, so that we make sure we are not harming people, and to the best of our abilities, we might be even promoting benefits. Maybe to the people to involve, but definitely to right, the larger community. Did, uh, would you imagine that the study on diabetes received IRB approval for the Havasu 5? I guess, right, and they showed a few signatures. They said that probably the people participated. Do you think that the other researchers that were studying with the schizophrenia and migration patterns also got IRB approval? They may have, but they may not have gotten results. So here's where the lines turn gray, right? Because they didn't have to go back to the people to get any information. They didn't necessarily have to get consent from the people to use their blood for something else. Now the laws are, start, are starting to change around this. There's the guidelines are starting to change. But back then and still today, if you're doing a, what they call a secondary data analysis, remember I showed you this on the levels of collaboration. If you're doing a secondary data analysis, you may never involve communities at all in collaboration. But is that right? Should they have? <coughs> well, it turns out for, so for a group like any of your organizations to also be involved in research, you should have in place something called a federal wide assurance, or a FOI. This is basically saying that your organization is engaged in some sort of research with humans and that it's conducting um, in support um, by an agency, such as like the um, United States Department of Health and Human Services. And that you have in place, in place assurances of compliance with the protection of human subjects, meaning you will do no harm to people. I'm going to guess that maybe there was an, an FWA in place here too. That maybe, because usually with Indian tribes, I do not know the case about this one, but usually they have in place, the, you know, the tribal councils have the approval and authorization to approve um, the conduct of research. That probably implies that they have a, a federal-wide assurance as well. And each institution or organization's uh, federal water assurance is identified with a specific number um, that's get, um, assigned to it by the federal government upon approval. And in order to have enough WA, all you need to do is specify someone in your organization who's responsible for the research, right? That they know that the research is happening, that it will be conducted in responsible ways, and that it's going through some sort of an IRB, an institutional review board. Yes? So the file basically uh, is some sort of an extension? No, it's the um, the FWA is an institution, uh, basically, uh, a assurance that your institution can be involved in research. Every university has a FWA. We have a federal wide assurance. We have to, and we have an institutional review board. I'm guessing, just guessing though, that the Havasupai tribe probably had a, a federal wide assurance in place as well. <coughs> And obviously, they went. They probably went through the institutional review board for the university. Maybe the tri tribe had it as well. Did that prevent the essentially what happened later on? That the blood, the um, does that help control what happens to the blood after the research is conducted? Well, because that would all have only been for the diabetes study and the secondary studies. They think they have this umbrella, but they haven't actually asked for. Bingo. So basically everything in place. So what Chris said is like, you know, the FWA doesn't assure that anything is given back to the communities, even though your institution would have to have a FWA in order to be involved in research, right? It doesn't mean that you know what researchers are going to be doing with that information. So let me just fast forward to the last slide I wanted to, to share with you. That on top of anything that the federal government has in place, and research institutions have in place to protect human participants in research, there's a whole host of issues that still need to be resolved that communities are usually very interested in. So in my experience, they include, well, cultural ethics. 
right? Did the researchers even understand what it means to believe that your blood is part of your body and to not treat it as data, but to treat it as human? That takes a lot of cultural ethics. Does the, do the researchers, the university researchers in this case, have training on what those cultural beliefs are, those practices are? Do they even ask the questions? Should they have? Did they need to? I feel for the researchers because they probably felt like they were doing their job because I think they went to the IRB and they made sure they had an FWA, but it wasn't enough. Secondly, this notion of ownership. Who owns the data, the blood, right? The information once it's collected. Does the IRB say anything around data ownership? If anyone's ever been through an IRB process before? Yeah. Yeah. I just have a question because I know my professors mentioned like the data ownership, like when they do it for a private, you know, private sector, like that after they've done their work, they don't own the ownership or the data, the company owns it and they can do whatever they want with it and they can exclude whatever they want. So I guess. Maybe. Bingo. So what Maria is basically saying is that in your experience, yeah. you've heard that once the data is collected, the institution that has it owns it. Because possession is 99% of the law, right? <laughs> <coughs> Who usually has data and is usually processing that data? Universities. Universities. And generally, in contracts, if you ever look at the specifics of your subcontract, if you get a contract with the university to be part of it, it usually specifies in there who owns the data. This is not a human subjects issue. This is not a research issue. This is an issue of an institution's policy. Right? So if you're concerned about who owns this information, and if you're going to have access to it, it needs to be a conversation right? before you sign on the dotted line between your organizations. Yes? I know a great example. It's called a community IRB. So Special Services for Groups in Los Angeles has a community IRB. Any of anyone can develop an IRB as long as you follow <coughs> federal regulations. It was actually developed by Jackie Tran over at Ocapica, so I defer to her as to the steps you go through in order to develop it. But the community IRB has community representatives. They ask questions like, what's going to happen to the community, the participants after the, you know, the information is collected? Will they find out about the information afterwards? Right? What will happen to the information, um, the data that's collected? Will, right? Will it be shared back with a larger community and benefit? Is this a stipulation for the IRB? No. That's why a lot of IRBs exist that don't have, ever ask these questions. But can a community IRB ask these questions? Yes. Right? Because communities have these, um, the, these missions right, and goals and values. Absolutely. So I would just, Jackie. <laughs> and this, all of this goes into the, the basic issue of community benefit. Who's holding researchers and the entire research team accountable right, to actually providing lasting benefit? I'm going to argue to you today that unless you're at that table, and by you I mean all, also the researchers in this room, because you are a special kind of researcher to sit through this, right? So that you have these values. You want to be in these relationships, I'm assuming. Right? So is everyone around the table discussing these things up front? And is everyone around the table keeping each other accountable throughout? And only if you have that, only in my belief, if you have true CBPR, can you address all these kinds of issues for which there are no wrong, wrongs or I mean no laws or regulations in place to guide. You are your best advocates. Um, I know I skipped a lot of um, different things. Um, I think I'm hoping you'll see that there are a lot of benefits to CBPR. 
that is very well suited to the populations you work with, that you can build trust and confidence between researchers and communities. It will improve the use, the conduct of the study, I believe, and the use. And it does address ethical consider considerations beyond what's available in, in IRBs and FAS and universities. 